morning, everybody. It's a privilege to be here again this morning uh, to be with you. And thank you for making it possible for me to be here. And thank you for the marvelous time of worship we've had. It's been very wonderful for me. And it's something that I always enjoy each time I have the privilege uh, of coming here. And uh, the words that have come forth um, have sort of resonated with the message that I have been given to share with us this morning. Um, Wendy talked about uh, the note of joy at the time you had your early morning prayer and how we ought to be a family. Um, Betty talked about, uh, you know, helping and being your sister's keeper or your brother's keeper. And uh, there were a few other words that came out like that, even in the prayers and in the songs that we had uh, that resonate with what I've been given to share. And I trust in the prayer that our brother has given, Andrew, that the Lord will open our hearts and our ears and our eyes that we may be able to see, we may be able to hear, and we may be able to believe and receive everything that he has for us this morning. So let's begin. And I'm starting with a question. And I often do that. How would you like to know that were you to suddenly lose everything today, you would not be alone? If you were to suddenly lose everything, whatever that means for you, it may be your house, your job, your income, health, whatever. And if you suddenly found yourself dumped in the pit, a very hard place, difficult place to be, wouldn't you like to know that you are not alone? I know that, I mean, in our society, at least materially, we have a, a social safety net that makes it impossible for you to fall below a certain level. And so you can quickly be picked up and helped up and hopefully be helped back to your feet. But that doesn't give you everything. You lose far more than just material things. Now, suppose you had a firm assurance that you could go somewhere where you'll be taken in, welcomed, cared for, and supported. I'm sure that you'll be very happy to find that place, even if you had to walk a hundred miles to get to that place. And that place, beloved, is right here where we are this morning, the house of God. I know that since uh, sometime last year we have been exploring uh, in this congregation how to build cross-cultural congregations. And when Martin spoke to me about speaking here this morning, he asked if I could, you know, uh, make a contribution to that in one way or another. And that's what I'm going to be doing this morning. And I'm going to be speaking about building the alternative society. Building the alternative society. Now, doing this has been the challenge that has faced every generation of Christians since Christ left the earth. How to build this alternative society or alternative community. Now, a lot of believers don't realize or take it too lightly that this is the main task that we've been given to do on earth here. Because we are in the world, but we do not belong to the world. So, immediately you become a Christian, a child of God, you automatically become a member of another community, a member of another society. Colossians puts it this way. It says we have been translated. There's a physical movement translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. There is a relocation from one place to another. Although physically we're still on earth, 
we have been moved. We are now citizens of heaven. We remain here only as ambassadors of heaven, ambassadors of Christ. When they quoted from that scripture this morning. That's why we're here. Now our job is to build a society, a community, or communities that present the alternative to the way the world lives. Now that's a huge task. It's a very difficult task. But that's the job that God has given to us. And it is even more difficult in this part of the world and in other parts of the world where um, people have become westernized. And I'm using that not as a, 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 a means of criticism, but for us to see that there is a difference between being fully in a relationship with God as a Christian and being a cultural Christian. I used to be that myself. Wherever the Western influence persists, whether it's in the Western world or in Asia, in Africa, you're going to find that. And in this part of the world where that the Christian values have permeated the culture and everybody basically is on their best behavior culturally, the church tends to assume that there is no problem. And so we can call ourselves a Christian nation, which isn't true. We may have a culture that has been influenced by Christianity. Of course, over the hundreds of years that Christianity has taken root in this place and from here has been transported to the rest of the world. Our culture, even the legal system, everything, the parliament, the sitting arrangement, influenced by Christianity. And so easily you can have a cultural Christianity different to the biblical Christianity. And so very often the church is in a place of confusion because it does not now realize it still has a duty towards the cultural world, the, the, the world that's been influenced by the cultural uh, Christianity. We assume that all is well because you go to the, the bus stop, people are polite, they are nice, they'll let you in even if you met them there. You know, people speak to you nicely and kindly and all of that. I mean, they, uh, people are generally humble and gentle and kind. Yet, they may not belong to the community of the people of God. Now, how we build that alternative society in such a way that it is attractive even to those who may consider themselves to be Christians and are not is our task. And it, it goes beyond whatever cultures we represent in this place, whatever nations we represent, whatever ethnicities and tribes and languages we represent. Because the culture of holiness, of walking with Christ, transcends cultures, uh, human cultures. My text is John chapter 13. And chapter 15. I'll read just a few verses from those two chapters. John chapter 13. I read in verses 34 to 35. And Christ is speaking here to his disciples. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 
And in chapter 15, <coughs> I read verses 12 to 14. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Tall order, as I have loved you, love that way as well. And it is by that love that people will know that you are my disciples. That's meant to be our badge. If we have any badge to wear as Christians, Christ says it is that love that we have for one another. And then he goes on to amplify it in, the, in chapter 15. He says, greater love has no one than this, than that a man or a woman should lay down his life for another. To lose your life for someone else. That's what it means. You love someone to the point of doing that. Of course, he was speaking about himself, but he also gave that as an example them because pretty soon after this he was going to go on the cross now let me share three thoughts with us this morning how we might go about doing this because if we read those verses carefully Christ is saying to us it's a command he's saying to us he can equip us to obey the command and he's saying to us we can obey the command so I'm going to share three things about how we get to do this. And the first thing that I want to share here is the power of intentionality. That is intention. I'm sorry if it sounds too big, but intention. Your intention. My intention. The power that it's got. Which means it's got to be more than a mere desire to obey, to do this. It's got to be more than a mere wish to obey what God has asked us to do. It means we go beyond and actually count the cost. What will it cost me? And what will it cost you? And what will it cost us to obey this commandment that Christ has given to us. We must count the cost because it's expensive. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us our privacy, some of it, not all of it. It's going to cost us money. It's going to cost us our comfort. And it could even cost us our lives, as Christ said. Greater love has no man than this, that, that a man should lay down his life for his friend. It's expensive. Now, the unique thing about Christianity, one of the unique things about Christianity, is the mystery of oneness. That no matter how diverse and different we are, if we are children of God, if we, each of us, have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible puts it, you're born again, we won. And that has come through this morning in some of our prayers and singing and, uh, you know, uh, and all of that. So we're children of God. We have the same Father. We're joint heirs. You mentioned that this morning, Andrew, with Christ. So whatever belongs to Christ, we partake of that as well. It's a huge thing. It says we're brothers and sisters. I don't often hear that. Now, I don't know how much we realize that, that as believers, we are brothers and sisters. Not blood brothers, not blood sisters, but higher than that. Spiritual brothers and sisters. So if I were to meet you on the road, I could say to you, Brother Andrew, because that's who you are to me. That relationship is the highest possible relationship on earth there can be. There can be nothing higher than that. And if I met you Wendy tomorrow somewhere, I'd say, 
my sister Wendy. Yeah, people may look at us, oh, come on, he's a black guy. How can he be calling Wendy? <laughs> His sister. But that's what it is. That's what the Bible teaches. I know sometimes we, we get too scientific in our thinking. I say, well, if he's not the same father, mother, then he's not my brother, he's not my sister. And then we go on to say, well, is that my cousin, first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, my uncle, my auntie, and all of that? Those are bloodline relationships. But the spiritual is the highest. And that's what God wants us to realize. And that's why that commandment is given. And that's why if we were able to obey that commandment, we will be building a very unique society, the kind of which you won't find anywhere around or anywhere else except where the power of the Holy Spirit is present to make that birthing possible. The Bible says we are all one in Christ. There is no Jew. There is no Gentile. There is no English. There is no Welsh. There is no Scottish. No Nigerian. No Zimbabwean. No Asian. Whatever all that tribes are represented here, they are canceled. They are not important. We are all one in Christ. Our Ephesians puts it this way. It says we are one body. We, are, we have one spirit. We have one hope. We have one Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all. It, it cannot be more intimate than that. It cannot be. And it is not possible for any one of us to enjoy the benefits that have been wrapped up in that oneness with Christ. It's a mystery. It's not possible for any of us to enjoy the benefits in isolation. So if I pull myself out of the body, I'm not going to enjoy the benefits. It's impossible. That's why the Bible talks about us being members of one body. Pluck out the eye, that eye dies, and the body suffers. So if I'm going to enjoy Christianity, I must be part of the body. And if you are going to enjoy Christianity, you also must be part of the body. It's not enough to come here on a Sunday and we have that fellowship, nice worship and everything, and we disperse and go home and wait till the next Sunday. We're not in fellowship. And we're not obeying the commandment. I know we meet during the week, Tuesday, house, cells, groups, and all of that, and so on. That's fine. But we cannot enjoy these benefits if we isolate ourselves. That's physically... Now, spiritually, we can also isolate ourselves. When we basically, yeah, we might be there, but we're not part of what's going on. Now, that may not be entirely our fault. It may be that the environment that we have, uh, and we blame ourselves together for this, may not be such that allows us to be vulnerable, to let people know where we are. And if we don't, express that vulnerability that it might be difficult for anyone to know where we are. And the kind of loving and caring and support that we may need to help us may not come. So it, it's important that we together are able to create that atmosphere where each person really realizes, look, I'm home when I'm here. This is my family. That's my brother. That's my sister. We may not live in the same house. I can be vulnerable with, with my people and let them know where I am at. And people can be vulnerable. I can, I, I can hear them. I will let them be vulnerable so that I can serve them and they too can serve me. And what this means basically is that each person, and this is the very first thing we do when we come to Christ, is that we surrender our lives. That's what we say. We surrender. We say, Lord, I give my life to you. Take it. So there's a sense in which that very first step you take, you are actually losing yourself. You are giving your life away. And you cannot hold on to it and give it away at the same time. It's impossible. Now, a lot of us come to Christ. We surrender our lives, but then we take it back. We hold on to it. There isn't progress there. 
And it leads to all sorts of complications in our spiritual lives and in our spiritual growth and in our fellowship and all of that. Now we must let go and let God. Paul puts it this way, dying to self. That's what it is. That's perhaps the theological term. We die to ourselves. Which means to give up your rights totally. It's a place where Paul, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 says, to the Jew I became like a Jew. To the Gentile I became like a Gentile. To this I became like that. But without sin. Say, so that by all means I might win some. And in that chapter he says, he basically surrenders his rights. His rights to be this, to be that, to be that, so that he can serve. He surrenders all. He makes himself 100% available to God, to the Holy Spirit, to be used in the way that God wants to use him. He has no private agenda. He has no personal uh, ambitions, except as the Holy Spirit gives him uh, instructions. That's what he's there for. And it's not just because he was an apostle. It's basically because he was a Christian. It's for us all to be able to make ourselves available that way. We die to self. Without that, without such death to self and such full surrender into the hands of Christ, it's impossible for us to be fully part of the fellowship. It's impossible for us to be able to fully serve the fellowship and also for us to be served ourselves. And so when we come because we find that it's expensive and we have to ask a series of questions at that stage of intention, do I really want to do this? Which means, do I really want to obey this? Am I sure? Am I fully persuaded that I want to do it? Not whether I can. That's not, not yet there. Do I want to? Now, except we have a ready willingness that we have counted the cost and we have accepted that, yes, I want to do this. I am ready. I am willing, even this moment, to take the step that God asks me to take. There is no progress. There is no success. We can't even do it. So, that intention must first be sorted. The second thing that leads, that leads to is the power of intercession. If you have solved the intentionality problem, you want to go forward, the next thing you realize, in fact, the very first thing you realize is that you cannot do it. You can't in your own power. No, you cannot. I cannot love you as Christ has loved us. It's impossible in my own power. And you cannot love me as Christ has loved you. You cannot do it in your own power. It's the first thing you realize as soon as you sort out your intentionality. Uh, yes, Lord, I'm available, I'm willing, and I want to do it. You come up short immediately. I can't do it. No, I can't. I want to, but I can't. And that drives you onto your knees to pray, to intercede. Now, it's something we do individually, but something we also need to do collectively as a body, as brothers and sisters. We ought to bear these burdens together. And we come to God. He's the one who has called us to it. He's the one who has given us this commandment. We come back to him and say, Lord, we cannot do it. We need your help. We need your grace. Because it's only going to be possible by the Spirit of God who is in us. And who constantly refreshes us, renews us, strengthens us. That we may go for that. And as we pray in a community where the Holy Spirit is, and as he is here, we, we, we hear the Spirit talking all the time through people in songs and prayers and all of that in prophecies. The Holy Spirit will do something. He will strengthen us. He will direct us. And he will also lead us. 
I, I remember very clearly reading about uh, Colin Okohat. Uh, some of you would know him here. Yeah? Colin Okohat. He was one of uh, the, the vicar at St. Hughes in the 70s in Louis Farm. And uh, God did amazing things at St. Hughes while he was there. And that's one of the things they did was this intercessory prayers. They prayed regularly, individually, and as a group, as, as a church. They came together often, often more than a lot of other churches, to pray and allow the Spirit of God to move, to help them. And it was said that at that time, I mean, they were also in groups, house groups, the way you, you have here, that if any member had a problem, within... Um, I think within an hour or so, the whole cell members would know. And within, by the end of the day, the whole church would know because the leaders would phone it across, you know, they contacted members and all of that. And from the moment it was passed on, people were praying. Wherever they were, at work, at home, on the streets, the moment they knew about it, they were already praying about that person because they felt it the way you will feel it if some part of your body was injured. The whole body rallies to protect that part of the body that has been injured. And that's what they always did. And they will pray and God always answer because they were united. That mystery of oneness came to work. They were, there is no way that God would deny such heartfelt prayers of his community where he, the Holy Spirit, is present and leading them. Amazing things happen. And it can be done here. That's simply what it shows. We can have it as well. We can rec recreate that, multiply that uh, everywhere. Now I go on to the last thing I want to share. It's in the power of intention or intentionality, the power of intercession. And this is the really difficult part, the last one. And it's the power of immersion. Immersion. That means presence. It means availability. It means being available, being present to get involved. Dirty hands, muddy feet. It's real work. And this is what the incarnation is about. Christ could have sat in heaven and sent his angels to come down to do the work. And they could, do, could have done it in two seconds. The snap of the finger. He didn't do that. He came down in person. He didn't come as an angel. He came as a lower status. In human form, we are lower than angels. He came as a human. He came born in a stable. He, lead, he had to flee for his life as a little baby to Egypt. As the one who created you and I. It's awesome just to begin to think about it, but the human mind cannot encompass it. And when he came back from Egypt, he went to live in Nazareth, very poor Nazareth, the son of a carpenter. And for 30 years, he was in almost total obscurity, the owner of the universe. And of course, when he came out of obscurity, he was hounded from pillar to post and ended eventually on the cross. He died. That's incarnation. It means, what, it means he came in person to do one thing, to let love be seen. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's why he came. What has been abstract all along, all through the Old Testament, the love of God, the presence of God was abstract. You couldn't see it. You couldn't touch it. You couldn't feel it. But Christ came to manifest that, to show that love, to show the world who God is, what he is like. And that was the only way we could know by his coming. And that's what Christ says to us, because the principle of incarnation is an example to us as well. 
that we are to walk in the steps of Christ and model that incarnational principle. So we need to be present. It's not enough to send. It's good to pray, but we must also be present to show the love of God. We are each a part of the whole. Each of us must serve, and each of us must allow ourselves to be served. I know it's part of the culture of very educated people to be self-sufficient and to resist every attempt to be helped, to reject every form of uh, support. Yeah, it is, but it's not Christian. It's part of Christianity to all, that you are a member of the body and allow yourself to be served by the body. If we don't allow that, you don't give permission, then nobody will serve you. Then you are not part of the body. It's not enough for you to serve alone. No, it's good to serve. And by all means, serve. But also, relax and let people serve you. Receive service as well. Because you are part of the body. I want to read in Acts uh, chapter 2 to see the kind of fellowship that the early Christians enjoyed as a result of this kind of fellowship. In Acts chapter 2, it's, it's a very familiar passage from verse 42 to 47. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as, they, as any had need. And day by day attended the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received food, uh, their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord, and this is crucial, added, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. There's something I picked up from the door there, supposed to our connectedness. That's powerful. It says, get connected. That's what the people did there. They were connected. And because of that connectedness, they were able to do all that. Nobody lacked anything. They had more than enough. Because they realized that, you see, what I have doesn't really belong to me. I have surrendered myself. I'm dead to self. There is no self. It's Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, Paul says in Galatians, I live by the grace of the Son of God who died for me. So what I have is not mine. It belongs to God. I'm just a steward. I'm a steward. That's what those people realized. When we come and place ourselves in that place, when we realize that we are stewards of whatever is in our hands, our perspective will change. Our, our connectedness makes it impossible not to care and be cared for. And that's why James, in chapter 2 of James, It says from verse 14. It says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? good. Our connectedness makes it possible to reach out with impact. 
we talked every time of growing our congregation, bringing neighbors, people from outside, and all of that. If you look in Acts, I mean, Matthew chapter 25, I, I won't be able to read it because of time, but we are familiar with what Christ did there. It's one of the scenes of the, the, the last judgment uh, where it talks about uh, the six works. It says, food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, welcome for the stranger, clothing for the naked, visit to the sick, and visit to the prisoner. And the amazing thing is that when, while those people were doing those things, they didn't actually realize they were doing it to Christ. And Christ says, because they asked him, when did we see you hungry and we fed you, uh, naked and clothed you? He said, when you did it to that person, it was me. Now, that boggles the mind a bit. If somebody is in need and stands before you, that person is Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. It's Jesus Christ. Treat him as you would Christ. I mean, if we heard today that Christ was here, waiting at your door in tattered clothes, I bet you you're going to strip yourself naked and say, Lord Jesus, you cannot be naked. I'd rather go naked. That person before you who doesn't look like Jesus is Jesus. He is the very Christ. He's not going to come uh, in person and appear to all of us differently or in different places, but no. Because we've got the spirit of Christ who dwells in each person. And as you are here, I'm here, everyone else is here, we are many Christs. That's where the word came from, Christians in Antioch. Many Christs, little Christs. That's who we all are. So the suffering believer is a suffering Christ. The hungry believer is a hungry Christ. The naked believer is a naked Christ. The homeless believer is a homeless Christ. Now, if you saw the real Christ, you know what you will do. And the Bible says, do that to that believer, and not just the believer, but the one after, but begin from within. And when you start from within, what a wonderful testimony to the outside world. I close with this story. About two and a half years ago, finished my training in Cambridge as a Methodist minister, but I couldn't be stationed immediately, so I had to come back to my home in Luton. But my home was not available. Someone else was there, yet I had to leave college on August 31, 2011. We already had a place, but 12 days to movement, I mean 12 days to the end of the month, we lost it. It was pull, pulled out at the last minute. And so we basically didn't know where to go. We had nowhere to go. But the circuit here knew about the matter. I told them. And we just kept praying, my wife and I, just praising God and praying, just praising God and praying. Now I tell you something, it was a powerful testimony if I had to sit down, both of us, to say, okay, where do we go? Let's begin to draw up a list of friends whom we can contact to help us. I don't think there would have been a white person on that list. Not that I don't think I know there would not have been one white person on that list. Not because I didn't have white people that I was friendly with, but I simply would have said, ah, I don't know these people well enough. I'm not sure. I mean, I can't ask them. I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to let myself down by asking, so I'm not going to ask. But I've drawn up a list that had, you know, black people that I said, well, okay, I know that guy. I can talk to him and all of that. 
But we didn't do that. We just left it to the Lord and just kept praising God and praying. And before the 12 days were up, we had about three or four offers to come back to Luton within the South Bedfordshire circuit. And different families said, you can come. Yes, you and your wife and uh, that can stay here. The other kids can stay here and all of that and so on. We had offers. Now, we spent 14 weeks on the road. And in those 14 weeks, we lived in three different addresses. And you know what? They were all white people. In fact, one of them, the very first person we stayed with, he and his wife, um, we spent seven weeks there. The day we got there, we said, Greg, this is your home. You're welcome. Anything you want to do, if you want to move the furniture around, move it, make yourself comfortable. He said, six weeks before we had the problem, God spoke to him in a dream that he was sending me and my family to him to look after. And that's how, when the problem came, that was before the problem came, when the problem came, we said, yes, send them. We spent seven weeks there, then five weeks in uh, an, another lady's house, uh, a single lady, an elderly lady, and she came around yesterday to the house to bring some food, again, a cooked meal. And then two weeks in one of our ministers' homes before our place became available, and we moved back in. Now, in the process, living together, I think God just arranged it because he wanted us to know each other better. And, uh, you know, some of them had never eaten pounded yam. And <laughs> I don't know how many of you have eaten pounded yam before. <laughs> you know, and some of the things we've never eaten, they cooked, we ate. So, I mean, we, had, we ate together. Coconut rice and stuff like that. It's part of, you know, it was really like living as a family. And that's what it was. That's what it meant to be. Brothers and sisters. So I know it's inconvenient. It is inconvenient. It is costly. It is expensive. But I ask you to consider the benefits. How society will see us. The power of our witness. How we shine as a light in a dark world. How we become the salt of the earth. How people will see our works and glorify God and how because of what is happening God himself begins to add people to us God will not add people to a place where they cannot find him he will add to a place where they will find him so this morning I ask you do you really want to obey the Lord in this matter? I know that you do. And so I urge you and I challenge you. Take just one step this morning. Just one. Come out of yourself. Come out. Let yourself go. Let God have you. After all, you're a child of God. Why are you worried? Why are you afraid? Why are all the anxieties and troubles and all the things that, you know, get in the way. Just let yourself go. Take your life and lay it at the feet of Jesus. And say, Lord Jesus, I leave my life right here at your feet. It's yours because you have paid the price for me. I do not belong to myself anymore. Whatever it is you want to do with me, do. If you are bold enough to take that step this morning, I guarantee you that you will be embarking on a very wonderful adventure. You never know where the Lord is going to end up with you. That's biblical truth. And it's been borne out by centuries and centuries of Christian history. If you can take that step this morning, now I'm going to pray with you. We'll pray together. 
If you want to take that step this morning, and that's all I invite you to do this morning. Take your life. Let's sit at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I leave my life here in your hands. It belongs to you. It's not mine. Do with it whatever you want to do. And if you want to do that, let's pray together. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the privilege of being your children. Thank you for the grace that bought for us the salvation that you have given to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming in person to show us what love is. You have said to us, we need to love one another as you have loved us. We need to lay down our lives for our friends if need be. There is no greater love than that. Lord, in spite of whatever intention we may have, we know that we cannot do it. We have not the strength to accomplish it. We ask you to help us. Give us the grace, Lord, to lay our lives at your feet, to relinquish them to you, because indeed they are yours, not ours. And allow you to do with our lives what it is you have planned, even from the, before the foundation of the world. Lord, give us the grace to let go. The grace to be free of all the worries and anxieties that make it difficult for us to let go. Free us from them all. And use our lives the glory of your name as you forge us into a community where your spirit is in charge and where mighty works are done and the surrounding society recognizes your presence and they are attracted and magnetized and your kingdom is glorified. This we ask Heavenly Father in the name of your only Son, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.